Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 5802 in the name of Christina McKelvey on behalf of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee on Hidden Lives, New Beginnings, Destitution, Asylum and Insecure Immigration Status in Scotland. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons now? And I call on Christina McKelvey to speak to and move the motion on behalf of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee. Convener, 10 minutes or thereabouts, please. Thank you very much, President Officer. Before I set out the committee's main findings, I want to say something which I hope will set the tone for today's debate. Destitution is first and foremost a humanitarian issue. People who are destitute are one of the most vulnerable groups in our society and they deserve our compassion and our support. A human response, one, which one, one that seeks to protect them, treats them with dignity, fairness and respect. In truth, presiding officer, we found the subject matter of our inquiry a difficult topic. Much of the evidence we heard was harrowing. We visited Shakti Women's Aid and heard from Hemet Griff Women's Aid and were deeply affected by the harrowing stories from the women there. Our report concerns lives that have been shattered through torture, exploitation, abuse and fear. These are hidden, hidden lives, but they are no less valuable than our own. We are seeking a new pre preventative approach, one which focuses on new beginnings. Our report, Hidden Lives, New Beginnings, asks a lot of the Scottish Government and it also calls on the UK and Scottish Governments to work together. We want a better life for those who come to the UK seeking protection, seeking sanctuary, but instead become destitute, fighting at the very least for an existence and at the very worst for survival. Our report is wide-ranging as this particular aspect of destitution has not been looked at before by a committee of this Parliament and we have made a large number of recommendations. Time will therefore not permit me to cover them all, but I am sure members of the committee will highlight other aspects of our work. I will therefore focus my contribution this afternoon on some specific findings. These are the harmful impact of destitution, destitution as a byproduct of the asylum process and as a result of fleeing domestic abuse, no recourse to public funds and women escaping that domestic abuse, the importance of independent advocacy to address destitution and the need for a national anti-destitution strategy. Firstly, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the British Red Cross in Scotland, the Children and Young People's Commissioner in Scotland, the Scottish Refugee Council, the Scottish, Scottish Women's Aid, Positive Action in Housing and in Gender, who made an impassioned and well-evidenced plea for the committee to consider this issue. As a committee, we succeeded in reading, re reaching a consensus on almost all of the conclusions and recommendations. This is a great achievement, given the subject matter covered, reserved and devolved areas, reserved and, devolved areas and diverse political views. Our agreeing, uh, on agreeing our report, a couple of members held different positions. One dissented from recommendation in paragraph 41, which recommended asylum seekers should be allowed to register an initial claim or a fresh claim in Scotland rather than having to travel to England and wanted further background information. While two members dissented from paragraph 207, which concluded the Immigration Act 2016 risks exposing more people to destitution as it provides for cuts to be made to asylum seekers support and gives power to compel local authorities to participate in wider dispersal. In conducting our inquiry, we had been keen to hear from those who had experienced destitution. That is why we enlisted the assistance of the organisations that I've already mentioned. Notably, individual testimony represented a significant, significant proportion of the 107 responses we received. We would like to express our particular gratitude to those who shared their real life stories, to the organisations which worked hard to help us gather this valuable information, and also to everyone who provided written and oral evidence. I wish to pay, pay a special tribute and say a special thank you to Olivia Nindotti, who courageously gave oral evidence to us, sharing her personal experience of destitution and her fight to gain accommodation and financial support for her and her son. News of her inquiry was far-reaching, so much so that we received correspondence, heartbreaking correspondence, from an asylum seeker in Turkey, whose family was facing destitution. The evidence gathered provided an unequivocal insight into the issues associated with destitution. A key theme to emerge was the significant detrimental impact destitution has on the individual, on their mental health, their ability to access health care, including maternity services, and in maintain, maintaining prescribed treatments. 
and the difficulties health practitioners faced treating those suffering. Glasgow Psychological Trauma Service told us, and I quote, when clients are destitute or at risk of destitution, the impact on mental health is significant. Clinicians and service users described worsening mental health problems. Destitution also increased clients' vulnerability to further trauma and re-victimisation and interfered with clients getting the health treatments that they needed. Finished quote. It was also important for us to understand why destitution occurred. The risk of destitution was present at numerous points within the asylum and refugee system, at the pre-asylum application stage, during the asylum process and post-decision, irrespective of a positive or a negative decision. Other reasons were linked to issues of domestic slavery, domestic abuse and threat of retribution from wider family members, where women had entered the country on a spousal or student visa and on fleeing from their partner found their immigration status was insecure. During our visit to the British Red Cross, we heard from parents who feared their children would be taken away. Some recounted being told by social work staff that the only way they could help was to take their children into care. A terrifying thought for any family. And on a personal level, presiding officer, as a former social care worker, I found those accounts deeply, deeply concerning. We found inconsistency in interpretation and, lang and application of child protection legislation, and I've asked for local authorities to review their training and guidance to ensure that there is no room for ambiguity. Destitute people are less able to access their rights and then to challenge any decisions. We heard about gatekeeping practices by public authorities. Worryingly, gaining support was described as, and I quote again, a gruelling fight. The Scottish Refugee Council advised of the 60% of initial claims refused, 20% went on to make successful claims. Being bit destitute made it more difficult for people to re-engage with the asylum system and to make a fresh claim, prolonging their destitution. Kirsty Thompson from the Immigration Practitioners Association told us the complexity of the legislation, the processes and the ability to access specialist legal advice meant there was a deficit in accessing justice. Advocacy, presiding officer, is crucial to help people access support to address their destitution. And so we have asked the Scottish Government, COSLA and our third sector partners to provide a fully funded independent advocacy service for those who are destitute. A huge commitment, I know, but if we help people at the early stages, then we don't have to pick up the pieces in the later stages. We feel strongly women fleeing domestic violence who have no recourse to public funds because of their immigration status should be given access to safe refuge accommodation and provided the financial assistance they need to survive. We should be ashamed that abused women have to use pillowcases as nappies for their children because they have no access to funds. We have asked for the Scottish Government to negotiate with the UK Government on this issue in particular. Meantime, we have asked for a crisis fund to help those most at risk. Core to addressing the issues set out in our report will be the development of a Scottish anti-destitution strategy to inform a national approach to mitigating destitution. I am not sure whether the Cabinet Secretary is in a position to offer a commitment on this today. I'll understand if she's not, but we hope she will agree that this would be a positive step forward. In conclusion, presiding officer, the committee calls on the Scottish Government to embrace a preventative approach to destitution. We all know that prevention is better than cure. And when we help people at the early stages of the destitution, they then don't take out from the service as much as they need in the later stages, should we have been uh, there early enough. Presiding officer, this will benefit Scotland. People will be spared the harmful effects of being trapped in a cycle of trauma. This is people who have come from trauma, seeking sanctuary here. Opportunities to exploit people for domestic slavery or criminality will be reduced. We have just released our new strategy on human trafficking today. This will help that because people will not be forced into dangerous situations. Public services won't have the same demand on them to pick up the pieces at that later stage. And non-governmental organisations can return their focus to core business and ultimately those who have had a positive experience of Scotland will integrate better and so will their children. Presiding officer, it is my pleasure to move this motion in my name on behalf of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee. Thank you very much.
I call Angela Conscience over the Government Cabinet Secretary General for seven minutes. Thank you, President Officer, and I thank the convener for her opening remarks. I'm very pleased that the committee has been able to secure today's debate. The Scottish Government has welcomed the committee's inquiry, which has given a much-needed focus uh, to the issues of destitution, asylum and insecure immigration status in Scotland. The committee's report is aptly named. There are too many people leading lives hidden from view and suffering the consequences of immigration and asylum policies built on, in my view, hostility at a time when they should be able to make a new beginning and a new life. We should be in no doubt that the causes of uh, the destitution which has been examined uh, by the committee is the asylum and immigration system itself, which is currently, as we all know, reserved to the UK government. I am therefore disappointed that the Immigration Minister declined the committee's invitation to give oral evidence, although I do note that he did provide uh, written evidence. And I firmly, firmly believe that it's better to prevent destitution in the first place uh, than to apply a sticking plaster uh, once the damage has been done. The committee has made a number of recommendations to the Scottish Government to try and mitigate the impacts of destitution caused by the immigration and asylum systems. And we will consider these recommendations carefully and fully eh, and will respond formally eh, in July to the committee to meet their timescales. In doing so, we will adopt both a sympathetic and a can-do approach, whilst being clear about the challenges where recommendations either cover areas that are reserved or are impacted by reserved issues. However, we will also be equally open to the opportunities uh, where we have devolved powers which could make a real difference to people facing destitution. So we will shortly be undertaking engagement to develop uh, the next New Scots uh, refugee integration strategy. Uh, New Scots takes a multi-agency uh, partnership approach and I want to see which recommendations uh, could be taken forward uh, through New Scots, bearing in mind uh, that it does not cover the immigration uh, aspect of the committee's inquiries. So there are some aspects of an anti-destitution strategy uh, that could be taken forward as part of New Scots. Design officer, destitution, in my view, is built into the asylum system. It is in the rate set for asylum support. How many of us could live on £36.95 pence a week? It is in the length of time people have to wait to receive the support. And it is in the ending of support to many of those who have been refused asylum. It is also in the mismatch between the 28 days uh, that people have to leave their asylum accommodation and support and the length of time it takes for benefits to be paid uh, when they are you know, eventually granted refugee status. This is at a very time uh, that people should be able to be getting on uh, with their new lives in Scotland. And I have uh, met families who are suffering the, the devastating uh, impacts of uh, the destitutions which is a, a consequence of the system. And these are families with uh, young children who have faced the terrifying reality of being homeless and penniless, uh, not knowing uh, how they would get by from day to day. And all after seeking a place of safety and refuge to escape the trauma uh, of their previous lives. Destitution does not only impact on the individual, it impacts on our communities. We believe that asylum seekers and refugees should be welcomed and supported to integrate into our communities from day one. This is the key principle of our new Scotch refugee integration strategy. And if people have to spend all their time fighting off destitution and are susceptible to exploitation, integration is therefore impossible. And this is first and foremost devastating for them, but it is also a loss to our communities of culture, of skills and of friendship. And the Scottish Government and our partners in the third sector uh, and charities uh, and the local government are literally paying the price of the UK government's policies on asylum and immigration. And we are all paying for the services and support uh, that would not be required if people were not being left destitute uh, in the first place. The success of the Syrian resettlement programme shows what can be achieved when programmes are sufficiently funded. Uh, Scotland has now welcomed around 1,700 uh, Syrian refugees uh, into 31 local authority areas. And the committee has rightly said that this is the standard that we should be aiming for uh, in both the asylum system uh, and in resettlement. 
And the tailored support that is part of the resettlement programme is in stark contrast to the complete lack of support provided to people uh, in the asylum system. And that includes people uh, who receive uh, refugee status. And this is the, the driving, this is the driving the force that's creating a two-tier system uh, and risks uh, the division between communities. And the Scottish Government will absolutely do what it can to take a holistic approach to all refugees and asylum seekers, but we cannot tackle the root cause while asylum and resettlement remain uh, reserved. The Scottish Government presiding officer plays its part by supporting organisations working with uh, asylum seekers uh, through the uh, Promoting Equality and Cohesion Fund, including the British Red Cross, uh, Positive Action Housing and the Scottish Refugee Council uh, with over £800,000 of investment. Uh, and this includes £39,000 specifically for the British Red Cross for its short-term asylum uh, response project, uh, which provides uh, emergency humanitarian uh, assistance. Presiding officer, I am particularly concerned about the needs of asylum-seeking children. The interests of the child must always be paramount, and that is why unaccompanied children uh, in Scotland are looked after children and have the right to be supported uh, by an independent guardian. And I will continue to work for the reinstatement of the Dubs Amendment for the most vulnerable unaccompanied children in Europe. The Dubs Amendment has provided the only uh, legal route, the only safe legal route for unaccompanied children uh, out with the Middle East and North Africa area to reach the UK. And without it, uh, thousands of children will be condemned uh, to an uncertain future. Presiding officer, I believe that destitution should never be an outcome of the asylum process. It is unacceptable that people fleeing war and terror should end up destitute or homeless in a country where they have sought refuge. Uh, while people are living in Scotland, no matter uh, what their immigration status, they should be treated as part of our community and be able to live uh, fulfilling lives. So our asylum and immigration systems should support uh, that very simple objective, uh, not hinder it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call on Annie Wells to open for the Conservatives. A generous six minutes, Ms Wells. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. And firstly, I would like to thank all those who gave evidence to this inquiry by the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, of which I am a member. And I look forward to this debate this afternoon, and we will be supporting the motion in Christina McKelvey's name today. The evidence which we heard in committee highlighted areas where improvements can be made to ensure that vulnerable people are not at the risk of destitution. We need a system which is more accessible and more flexible, whatever stage an asylum seeker is at. The Refugee Council, SRC, told us that people have to travel to Croydon to make an initial asylum claim, and if they are refused, they have to travel to Liverpool to make a fresh claim. They therefore raised concerns over accessibility, which must be looked at closely and quickly. When people cannot access the asylum system, they can be left in a vulnerable position. They can be left with no recourse to public funds. A cause for even greater concern is where the report says that people with insecure immigration status find themselves destitute for a combination of reasons, but mainly linked to human trafficking or abusive relationships. Human trafficking is a serious problem in the region which I represent. And two weeks ago, BBC Scotland broadcast a shocking documentary on this despicable trade. It provided clear evidence of young girls being trafficked from Slovakia to Glasgow, where they are forced into sham marriages to local men. And that is a scandal that is going on right under our noses right now. Therefore, it's essential that we keep the Human Trafficking Exploitation Scotland Act 2015 under review to ensure that our police officers have the powers they need to tackle this problem and save those young girls from this horrific violation and exploitation. I will continue to hold the Scottish Government to account on this matter. The committee recently visited Shakti Women's Aid in Edinburgh and we heard from a number of women who found it challenging to access the support they needed. Again, they had often come from abusive relationships or had been victims of human trafficking and others had sought refuge to avoid their young daughters being forced to travel abroad to undergo the inhumane procedure of FGM. Hearing about the experience of these women was truly emotional for all of us who were on the visit. As I noted earlier, we had heard concerns over how realistic it is to expect people struggling to travel hundreds of miles to make an asylum claim. While the Home Office needs to maintain an efficient service, which can cope with the number of claims it receives each year, 
it must also work to ensure that services are accessible. I recognise the Scottish Refugees Council's call for the Home Office to make use of its network of regional and local offices, including the one in Glasgow, to aim for a more accessible system. That is why I have written to the Home Office Minister, Robert Goodwill, this morning to ask them to consider the feasibility of allowing refugees to lodge their claims in any fresh claims in Scotland. The evidence which we heard in committee was not only effective at identifying the problems, but also at making suggestions of how we can begin to make the system work better. In particular, the SRC, while supporting the report's overall recommendations, asked us to consider three recommendations in particular. Firstly, I think it's clear from the evidence we heard that we need a Scottish anti-destitution strategy, and I'm pleased to hear the, Minister, the Cabinet Secretary say that that is something that's going to be looked into. And I believe that the anti-destitution strategy can bring the focus to this issue which it deserves. This strategy can focus on preventing destitution in the first place, but will of course require leadership from and cooperation between the Scottish and UK Ministers. This strategy should be developed in partnership with the National Practitioners Network, involving those with experience of providing services to at-risk groups and sharing best practice to deliver a better quality of service. The network should continue working in partnership with the Scottish Government when its strategy has been developed in order to ensure it is working effectively. I would also strongly echo the calls by SRC for the Scottish Government, COSLA and third sector, part, third sector partners to consider funding an independent advocacy service for destitute asylum seekers and people with insecure immigra immigration status. This would allow them to begin the process of integration into UK society as quickly as possible and allow signposting to key services to begin at an earlier stage. In conclusion, presiding officer, the Conservatives are determined to build an asylum and immigration system which ensures fairness and offers support to vulnerable people and that has the confidence of the people who are already in the UK. The UK has a proud history of helping those who are in most need and we are committed to the UK remaining a sanctuary for refugees and asylum seekers but by understanding the concerns raised by this report and acting on many of its recommendations, then we will be better able to make that ambition a reality. I urge the Scottish and UK Government to consider the report's findings carefully and address the concerns that the motion identifies. And I will be supporting the motion at decision time. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call on Mary Fee to offer Labour a generous, I keep saying generous, but nobody's using You're it, very six kind, minutes. You're very officer. Thank you. you. There you go. I'll take more than six minutes then. I'd like to take this opportunity at the start of the debate to thank everyone who assisted the Equalities and Human Rights Committee in producing this report on destitution, asylum and insecure immigration status in Scotland. And on behalf of all of the members of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, can I thank all the witnesses who gave evidence to the committee, all the individuals who contributed written submissions and all individuals and organisations who assisted the committee's research on destitution, asylum and insecure immigration status. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank the clerks on the committee who provided expertise and assistance to all members throughout this process. And it's only right and just for me to commend the strength and courage of the people who the committee met, seeking asylum and refuge and living in destitution. Their personal accounts of fleeing persecution, warfare and suffering in their home nations for the refuge of Britain of their individual struggle for survivor, survival and who continue to live a life of extreme destitution in the land which they once hoped could offer them safety and comfort were harrowing and inspiring in equal measures. And from the outset, it should be made clear that the Equalities and Human Rights Committee fully recognises and accepts that immigration is a reserved issue. However, the UK's the UK government's immigration policy has a profound impact on Scotland. And the majority of the committee believes that fundamentally, the Immigration Act 2016 risks exposing more people to destitution, which could either further traumatise them or make them vulnerable to exploitation. The committee's report outlines a plethora of recommendations and points for consideration to the UK government, the Scottish government, and Scottish local authorities. 
The current UK immigration and asylum system fails to treat our fellow human beings with dignity and respect. The system fails to appreciate and understand the extensive variety of complex circumstances which help to explain why individuals seek refuge and asylum in the UK. And I'd like to specifically focus my remarks on the experience of women seeking refuge and asylum in Scotland, who are most at risk of destitution. Destitution is linked to marginalisation and oppression. And the truth is, women seeking refuge or asylum in the UK are often survivors of domestic abuse, genital mutilation and rape. The insecure immigration status of these women leads to further exploitation. An insecure immigration status is linked to women's experience of abuse, violence and having their liberty and autonomy severely restricted. In their evidence to the committee, Scottish Women's Aid articulated, and I quote, women with insecure immigration status experience specific patterns of abuse. Destitution is built into the current system due to the fact there are only a few locations in England in which asylum claims can be dealt with. The only place where people are able to register their claim to seek asylum is in Croydon. The only place where people who have been refused asylum can make a fresh claim is in Liverpool. This results in the indefensible situation in which individuals who have fled from conflict, fled from human rights abuses and fled from humanitarian crises travel a tra travelling a treacherous journey of in many cases many thousands of miles across continents to arrive in Scotland and then being expected to travel on an eight hour bus journey to Croydon to register their claim to seek asylum. The current immigration system lacks compassion it fails to treat our fellow human beings as just that, fellow human beings. Instead of our immigration system offering support and an inviting welcome to vulnerable and marginalised people who have travelled to our country to seek safety, the system appears to add to their suffering and increase the likelihood of them becoming destitute. The committee supports the recommendations of the Scottish Refugee Council to open local and regional offices in order to make the system more accessible to newly arrived women, men and children. In Scotland, we need a more collective approach. The Scottish Government should work with local authorities and third sector partners to identify the number of individuals in destitution and those with insecure immigration status. Meaningful data will help to inform policy and enable a much more coordinated approach to tackling destitution. The Establishing Migrants Access to Benefits and Local Authority Services in Scotland guidance should be updated as a matter of extreme urgency. And it's vital that this guidance is a living document that does make meaningful change to individuals that are in need. The Conservatives' defence of the UK's current immigration system is unsustainable. It is inefficient, illogical and lacks any sense of compassion or any sense of understanding. There is hope of a better future. There is hope that our immigration system can change. An immigration system that treats people with compassion and with understanding. However, change will not come with the election of another callous Conservative government, hell-bent on achieving arbitrary immigration targets by dehumanising our fellow human beings. And this is time for Conservative MSPs in this chamber for once to do the right thing and call on their colleagues at Westminster to radically review the Immigration Act 2016. Thank you. We now move to the open contributions um, of around six minutes, please. We do have a, a wee bit of time in hand if people want to intervene and respond. And I call Gail Ross to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, President Officer. 
Anyone reading this report will conclude that there is both that more the Scottish and the UK governments can do to address the subject of destitution. This is a hugely complex piece of work and I also would like to thank everyone that has contributed to evidence sessions, welcomed the committee on visits and also the clerks for all their hard work. Destitution is defined under Section 95 of the Immigration and Asylum Act 1999 as, quote, anyone who does not have adequate accommodation or the means of obtaining it, whether or not essential living needs are met, or someone who does not have adequate accommodation, who does have adequate accommodation, sorry, or the means of obtaining it, but cannot meet other essential living needs. This report, prepared by the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, examines the impact of destitution on asylum seekers and those with insecure immigration status. People who have fled their country and lodged an application for protection, people who have had their claim for asylum granted, and people with insecure immigration status who are waiting on a response from the Home Office are the real subject of this report. During this debate and the work that follows, I sincerely hope that we can all focus on the humanity of the situation that people find themselves in and not get bogged down in statistics because we can and must improve the situation for these people. Presiding officer, I only joined this committee after the Easter recess, but on reading the report, the official reports from the committees and hearing the feedback from the other committee members, it's not difficult to see that these evidence sessions were very emotionally draining. One of the huge injustices that struck me as we went over the report was the part about destitution and insecure immigration status, and all the speakers before me have touched on this as well. And I'll quote from page 10, section 37 of the report. The reasons given for this were more likely to be linked to issues of domestic abuse, domestic slavery, and the threat of retribution from wider family members, for example, a woman who was forced into a marriage of domestic slavery but having escaped had no documentation to prove who she is. People living in fear for their life and the lives of their children, including fear of honour killing, female genital mutilation, incarceration and death. Women who have stayed with abusive partners so as not to become destitute or had left abusive partners and were now destitute. It's clear to us that the asylum and immigration system is peppered with points at which the risk of destitution becomes more likely. The sheer complexity and inaccessibility of the process makes it unnecessarily difficult in practical terms for someone who is new to the UK, who is destitute, to initiate the process. And destitution is further built into that system by there only being certain geographical locations in England where parts of the process can be accessed. Now, we know that people arriving in Northern Ireland don't have to travel to Croydon to make an initial claim. So it's unacceptable that destitute, vulnerable people are forced to continue, continue in the UK what will already have been a very difficult journey. And we are in no doubt that destitution should not happen as a result of failings in the system, as we heard about with refugees moving from asylum accommodation. Sadly, presiding officer, I would contend that people are being made destitute because of the complicated and onerous system that confronts them when they arrive on our shores. Vulnerable, poor, frightened, disadvantaged people must be protected and offered sanctuary, not regarded as a statistic. So what can we do? The recommendation made by the majority of the committee at section 41 asks the Scottish Government to intensify its negotiations with the Home Office to ensure that people who arrive in Scotland and wish to make a claim for asylum should be able to do so here in Scotland and not have to travel to Croydon. And we've also recommended that we stop forcing those who wish to make a fresh claim to have to make the journey to Liverpool to complete this we need to establish why these journeys are being forced upon vulnerable people and if there is a way to change that. Presiding officer, the message from the report was as damning as it was clear that destitution is built into the UK asylum process. Positive Action in Housing's director, Rubina Quarshi, said, this report is a stark reminder that the UK asylum process, instead of sheltering vulnerable refugees while they try to build new lives, 
is fast-tracking men, women, and children into a deeper humanitarian crisis of absolute destitution. And Scottish Refugee Council Policy Officer Graham O'Neill said, today's report is an important wake-up call to severe human rights problem, often called destitution. The simple truth is that UK governments have sanctioned destitution as a policy lever and it has failed completely. This report is a blueprint for Scotland to develop a humane, preventative and more effective model against destitution. The report calls for several things. The creation of a Scottish anti-destitution strategy. There is also the need for government and other agencies such as the third sector to work together across all sectors with the aim of mitigating the negative effects that destitution has on asylum seekers. More needs to be done to identify how widespread destitution is among asylum and insecure immigrants. Asylum seekers should be allowed to work, paid or unpaid, giving themselves the means not to become exploited or destitute, and also to help their physical, mental health and self-esteem. That a destitution fund be created by the Scottish Government to help women who are suffering domestic abuse and cannot find other help. To look at extending free bus pass travel to asylum seekers so that they can travel to hospitals or appointments. And there should be a national coordinated practitioners network. And this would comprise of several agencies, including the Scottish Government, health boards, local authorities, NGOs, the third sector and the legal sector. And also that COSLA guidance should be updated for local authorities to let people know what help is available to them. Presiding officer, no one flees war and persecution in their own country and have to come to the UK or Scotland to face destitution. We are asking both the UK and Scottish governments to make changes to ensure that these people who are already weak, scared and vulnerable are helped when they need it most, not forced into more unimaginable situations because the help is not available. And there are many good examples out there of organisations and individuals that are doing excellent work in this field. But this report shines a light on a problem that is quite often hidden in plain sight. Thank you. I call Jeremy Balfour to be followed by Ross Greer. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I too uh, welcome uh, this opportunity to debate the report. Um, and as a member of the committee, I too want to start by thanking those that gave us both oral and written evidence over the last few months. I think without their evidence, without their openness, um, we would not have the report that we have before us today. Can I also thank the clerks for pulling this together and for keeping us moving in the right directions. I think this report shows that there are many issues around this area, that it is simplistic to think that we can simply do one or two things and everything will improve. What we do need to see is a, a, working, a, a closer working between Scottish Government and UK Government, between Scottish Government and local authorities, and local authorities and the third sector. Because what became clear to me, and I think to others on the committee, was that there are actually good practices out there. There are lots of good um, ways that we should do things written down, but often they're not getting to the grassroots. Too often policies are being written and left on the shelf. And too often uh, when someone walks in and has their first contact with a social worker or from someone else, it is not a good, positive experience. So I think the first thing that I would want to see happen is for local authorities, through COSLA, through other ways, to be sharing information in a more uh, professional way so that everyone understands, firstly, what the law is at present, and secondly, how we then apply that law to individual cases. I think that is becoming, going to become... Oh, sure. Ross Greer. I thank Mr Balfour for taking that intervention. I'm wondering what his response is to the comment the uh, COSLA made to the committee that destitution was an inevitable consequence of the immigration system as created by the UK government. 
Jeremy Balfour. I don't accept that statement by Cosler, and I think where Cosler um, has failed in its work is that it has not distributed the information down to the 32 local authorities in a proper way. And actually, as I was about to say, this is going to become more and more important if we are going to see the system rolled out across Scotland. At the moment, predominantly Glasgow um, and Lanarkshire and to some extent Edinburgh. But if this is going to go to other parts of the country, there needs to be a much greater access to the information. Well, we heard evidence, um, again, um, from uh, local authorities that within neighbouring local authorities almost, different practices have been followed. Uh, and that seems to me not acceptable. The other area I would just like to pick up on briefly, Deputy Presiding Officer, is in regard to that of advocacy and independent advocacy uh, for those that are going through the system. Clearly, those that have arrived in this country come with a raft of different stories and experiences, but almost all of them have had a negative experience of their government or someone within authority over them. And I think there is a slight danger that our advocacy, which is done by those who are seen to be part of the system, will mean that people will not go forward and use that advocacy. And I do think we need to look at independent advocacy being independent and that being funded um, directly by Scottish Government. Whether that is CEB, CEB, whether that is advice shops, whether that is other third party organisations, I do think there needs to be a, a, a distinct difference between them and the state so that people feel that they are getting absolutely independent advice. That advice sometimes will come uh, from lawyers. And again, I think there is an issue around that people who deal with immigration law legally here in Scotland are, are based here predominantly in the central belt. And how do um, individuals who need advice, whether in the north of Scotland or other parts of Scotland, get that advice? There was an issue also raised um, around the whole question of legal aid in paragraph 63. And I think this is something um, that the Justice Minister um, and other uh, ministers need to look at uh, very quickly to make sure that people are not uh, losing out. Um, I do agree, agree with Gail Ross. We need to look at this as individual people rather than statistics. I think we need to look at this in a way that takes us away from cheap party scoring points and looks to see at what Scottish Government, UK Government and local authorities can do together to help these very vulnerable individuals. I, I think and hope that this report will shed light on practices that are happening at the moment. And I think there's a real challenge, uh, both for UK government and Scottish government, that we have asked for uh, progress back in a fairly short period of time. And the reason we've done that is because it is so urgent and we do need answers quickly. And I do hope uh, that when this comes back to the committee in a year's time, that we will have seen genuine progress and that people's lives will be made easier. Thank you very much. I call Ross Creer to be followed by David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. The work of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee on this issue has been fantastic, and I'm really grateful to them for having produced this report and the opportunity to debate it here in Parliament today. Asylum and the issues around it are, of course, significantly reserved to the Westminster Parliament, but the report recommends a range of initiatives that could be undertaken here in Scotland and which would be of real tangible benefit to the lives of some of the most vulnerable people in our country. In December of last year, we held a debate in this chamber welcoming the thousandth Syrian refugee to come to Scotland. Since that debate, the Westminster government have ended the DUB scheme, as the Cabinet Secretary mentioned. This is a scheme designed to take in unaccompanied child refugees, many of whom are currently destitute across the rest of Europe, at huge risk. 
Named after Lord Alf Dubbs, a former child refugee of the Holocaust and someone that I'm very proud to know, it was meant to take in 3,000 children. It took in barely a tenth of that, abandoning thousands more to, sorry, thousands more of the children most in need on this planet. They claimed that councils across the country didn't have capacity, but were immediately contradicted by councils in Scotland and the rest of the UK offering places. Quite frankly, they were lying. I know, I'm sure we all know, the efforts that some councils across Scotland and the rest of the country have gone to in securing accommodation, both for unaccompanied children seeking asylum, as well as for families coming through the Syrian resettlement scheme. The Green MSPs sent a letter to the Home Secretary and the Minister for Immigration requesting that the scheme be reinstated. This is the second time that we've formally written to the UK government with concerns over support for refugees and asylum seekers. And they've not had the courtesy to respond to either. So if Annie Wells manages to receive a response from them, she should let us know what the trick is. In government, the Conservatives have consistently contributed towards the instability across the world, which forces millions to claim asylum. They've even brought arms manufacturers to this parliament the very company whose weapons turn innocent people into refugees by destroying their homes, their schools and their hospitals. And yet when a very few dare to come here to claim asylum, the Westminster government do everything they can to turn them away, to offer them as little support as possible, to make it a difficult, a gruelling task to get residency here. The committee has noted the distances that they need to travel to Croydon, to Liverpool, to make initial claims and to reapply if rejected. As I mentioned to Mr Balfour, Andrew Morrison from the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities told the committee that destitution was an inevitable consequence of the UK immigration system as it sought to create a hostile environment for those who do not have a legal right to be in the UK. Now, I've seen the reality of the refugee crisis. I know exactly how much these people need some basic compassion when they arrive in Europe. Last month I was in Lampedusa, which is the small Italian island at the centre of the refugee crisis since the uh, European Union's deal with Turkey closed routes through the Balkans. In 2016, at least 6,000 people drowned trying to reach Lampedusa. The reality is the number will be far higher than that. And just before we arrived, another boat sank. As Patrick Harvey mentioned at First Minister's Questions, last Wednesday, 34 people, almost all babies and toddlers, drowned. And the horrors experienced by survivors are beyond what any of us can comprehend. We met Vivian, a 17-year-old from Central Africa. She was pregnant by rape. She'd been kidnapped twice, forced into prostitution. Her best friend had drowned in the Mediterranean. We saw the grave of Walela, an 18-year-old from Eritrea. She'd suffered terrible burns when gas canisters had exploded in the Libyan warehouse that she was held in. Rather than take her to hospital, the people smugglers put her on a boat to die in agony at sea. And we saw the unmarked graves, for those whose names, ages and stories we'll never know. These are desperate people asking for nothing more than safety and security. But even if refugees do make it to the UK, their struggle doesn't end. This Westminster government and previous governments have constructed an asylum and refugee policy which is heartless and immoral. A system that does not offer the safety, security or dignity that asylum seekers are entitled to. We have a system that lines the pockets of multinational providers like Circle, G4S and their subcontractors. A system that puts profit and cost saving before basic rights and dignity. In January, the UK Home Affairs Select Committee published a report on Compass, the provision of asylum accommodation in the UK. What they found is simply sickening. It included infestations of rats, mice and bedbugs, rotten sofas, dirty carpets, women in late stages of pregnancy being forced to share rooms, and accommodation without locks and completely unfit for habitation. Now in Glasgow, we've heard of atrocious living conditions in substandard housing being provided by, for example, Orchard and Shipman. They've been the subject of numerous allegations of putting vulnerable people in slum-like conditions. Health professionals and charities say that the health of refugees, particularly children, have suffered as a result of that. What kind of society can tolerate this treatment of those who've came here seeking refuge? It is essential that asylum support services are entirely devolved to Scotland, as this parliament voted and agreed on a number of months ago. If the UK government won't operate on the basis of dignity and respect, then we will. But as I mentioned, there is plenty that the Scottish Government could take a lead on right now. Free bus passes for those in destitution is an excellent recommendation from the committee, for example. And this could be extended to all refugees and asylum seekers, though I recognise the identification issues that a wider rollout might face. The recommended advocacy service for people in destitution whose immigration uh, status is insecure is an excellent idea. 
but it shouldn't only be limited to those who are destitute. Many whose residency here is insecure would benefit immensely from such a service, and it would likely head off large numbers of cases of destitution. This is an excellent report. It's one that the Parliament should be very proud of. The UK government, on the other hand, should be ashamed of its findings. Not that they're anything new. Not that this is the first time that people here, in other parliaments and devolved assemblies in these islands, charities or NGOs have said before. Even the United Nations has had much to say about how the UK government treats refugees and asylum seekers. But the Scottish Government should take on its recommendations and show that when powers lie with this Parliament, we can create a dignified, just society for all those who need it. I call David Torrance to be followed by Finlay Carson. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the opportunity to debate the report from the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, Hidden Lives, New Beginnings, Destitution, Asylum and Insecure Immigration Status in Scotland. President Officer, I would like to thank the Committee's clerks for their help and effort during the evidence sessions and bring this report to its final conclusion. I would like to thank all the organisations and individuals who have submitted or come before the Committee to give evidence. However, I must stress my disappointment at the lack of engagement by a UK Government who refused to contribute any evidence, even in person or by video conference. Since January, the Committee have worked hard to understand the challenges faced by asylum seekers and refugees and what the Scottish Government UK Government, local authorities and the third sector can do effectively tackle the risk of destitution for each and every person fleeing persecution and seeking a safer and fairer life here in Scotland. Scotland has a proud history of inclusivity and our approach to helping asylum seekers and refugees integrate into mainstream society has been praised by the Equality, Local Government and Communities Committee of the National Assembly of Wales. This is in stark contrast to the approach being taken by the UK Government. Evidence received by committee showed destitute is built into their harmful process and creates a two-tier system of protection, which forces far too many people into hardship and has a hugely detrimental impact on their integration into our communities. Individuals who have fled from dreadful circumstances are finding themselves trapped in destitution and homeless, often for years as a direct result of the asylum process. The system places unfair stresses and constraints on claimants that impact on the whole of our society. We need to a more inclusive and fairer approach to assessment process. Andrew Morrison from the Convention of the Scottish Local Authorities, COSLA, summed up his view when he stated destitution was an inevitable consequence of an immigration system as it sought to create a hostile environment for those who do not have a legal right to be in the UK. Graham O'Neill of the Scottish Refugee Council described the UK government's policy as, quote, inhumane and senseless and advised that we were, there was a significant risk of exploitation including sexual, to newly arrived asylum applicants seeking to fund the travel to Croydon. This also includes individuals who have been refused asylum and are required to travel to Liverpool to submit a fresh claim. The Scottish Refugee Council have called for the Home Office to make use of its extensive network of local regional offices to make access in the system more accessible for newly arrived destitute women, men, children to register a claim. The Committee recognises that the UK Government and the Parliament only have the power to legislate on asylum and immigration and asks the Scottish Government to continue its negotiations with the Home Office to allow people who arrive in Scotland to be allowed to register their claim here in Scotland and to allow fresh claims for asylum to be submitted here in Scotland. Currently, the National and Local Government and First Sector are finding themselves paying the price for the failure of the UK Government policies and the ineffective asylum process and immigration system. This cannot go on. In particular, Glasgow City Council and First Sector organisations cannot possibly sustain the level of services they are currently providing without additional funding to help. Local authorities are cautious about becoming involved due to a lack of funding, but the success of a Syrian resettlement programme highlights what can be achieved when programmes are sufficiently funded and more local authorities become involved. There are many First Sector organisations who have played a tremendous part in helping to meet needs of destitute asylum seekers and those with insecure immigration status. But without necessary backing, they will simply be unable to continue providing this vital assistance. I welcome recommendations in this report asking the Scottish Government, COSLA and the third sector partners to consider providing a fully funded, independent, advocacy service for destitute asylum seekers and people with insecure immigration and the creation of a national coordinate practitioners network. I firmly believe that early advocacy will result in long-term savings on health and social services whilst providing people with the best opportunity for part to start the integration process. A nationally coordinated practitioners network comprising of representatives from across a number of sectors would enable all parties to share the best practice and highlight concerns 
regarding legislation and practice. We need to better understand and address issues forced by those coming to Scotland seeking asylum. We must also strive to combat misconception often attached to asylum seekers that they do not need to be destitute in this country. They can simply choose to return to their country of origin. This is unfair and unjust. Given the choice, most people would choose to continue living in their home country, but due to devastating situations and events out of their control, find themselves with no choice but to seek asylum and a safer life for their family in a different country. Many claimants have fled from terrible violence and hardships. We need to ensure the provision and successful delivery of help and support those seeking asylum need to, need to continue learning, thriving and developing both mentally and socially. However, research shows that many barriers continue to impact on a daily basis, ranging from difficulty with travel costs to emotional strain that day-to-day -day uncertainty brings, isolation and a feeling of disconnection to wider society can also hamper opportunities and in turn create further barriers. Too many asylum seekers are left with no legitimate means of securing a livelihood. Denied access to financial support or the right to work, they are often forced to adopt strategies to cope with low income and often without homes, whilst dealing with extreme levels of despair at long periods of time spent in uncertainty of the asylum process. A high proportion of claimants report mental health issues, but this issue is substantially underreported in asylum seekers and refugee populations. A determined response is required to ensure that appropriate support is given through every stage of an asylum process to all asylum seekers living in Scotland who have been forced into destitution because of delays in administration of a complex and inefficient asylum system. We must work all work together to find solutions to the causes of destitution experienced by asylum claimants and improve efficiency as a matter of priority. In conclusion, presiding officer, the impending 2006 Immigration Act and subsequent changes to support have a real potential to increase the issue of destitution for many who come here for a safer environment and risk exposing even more people to further trauma. I urge the Scottish Government to consider the key findings and recommendations in their support and to undertake a Scottish-wide consultation. And I look forward to the Scottish Government report being submitted to the committee in one year's time. I call Finlay Carson to be followed by Sandra White. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome today's debate following the publication of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee's report into destitution, asylum and insecure immigration. My colleagues from the Equalities and Human Rights Committee tell me of some of the moving evidence they've heard on this issue and we've heard more this afternoon. The issues that are raised in the report are serious and many of the solutions are sensible. I support the call for the creation of a Scottish anti-destitution strategy. If we want to create policies that mitigate destitution, then it's vital that we have more information on the scale and nature of the issue. I would also welcome the creation of an independent advocacy service for destitution, uh, destitute asylum seekers. Skilled advocacy can help mitigate the issue of destitution and exploitation as asylum seekers are directed to the right financial support and accommodation. Finally, the creation of a national coordinated practitioners framework would enable best practice to be shared among health boards, local authorities, government officials and third sector organisations. I do, however, have some concerns about aspects of the, later, the latest report from the Equalities and Human Rights Committee. While its domestic focus brings to the fore some significant issues, we must also consider the international picture, for the international response informs the domestic response. To put the actions of UK government, Scottish government and local authorities into context, we have to look at domestic policy and, and international policy in equal measure. The report makes uh, or mentions little of the humanitarian efforts of the UK government in its response to the Syrian refugee crisis. The UK is the second largest donor and has committed over 2.46 billion to helping Syrian refugees in the region surrounding the war-torn war country. If we break that figure down, we find that the UK has provided about 20 million food rations, 4.5 million relief packages, 2.5 million medical consultations, and 400,000 shelters. British aid offers the greatest amount of help to the greatest number of Syrians who have fled to neighboring countries. As Rob Williams, Chief Executive Warchild estimated, Caring for the basic needs of a refugee in Europe costs at least 10 times as much as in countries neighbouring Syria. In 2016, the House of Commons International Development Committee praised the UK government's response as it discourages refugees from risking their lives 
on long perilous journeys into Europe, sometimes on unseaworthy boats and often at the mercy of human traffickers. And we hear almost daily, if not weekly, about tragedies in the Mediterranean. And here we must recognise the UK government's attempt to find an alternative system which provides refugees a safer and more secure passage to Britain. Created in 2014, the Vulnerable Persons Resettlement Programme works in conjunction with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. The programme is aimed at those refugees who cannot be supported in the region surrounding Syria, prioritising victims of sexual violence and torture, older people and disabled people. Under this programme, almost 5,500 Syrians were resettled in the UK between October 2015 and December 2016. Most importantly, refugee status is granted to individuals before they arrive in the UK. Upon arrival, the refugees should have immediate rights to work, to access welfare and to access public services such as health and education. As a result, the risk of destitution and insecure immigration is reduced. This is a major advantage of the Vulnerable Persons Resettlement Programme. The European Union is mirroring the UK's actions by taking steps to establish a system that supports targeted refugee settlement. As the European Commission stated in April 2016, the overall object is to move from a system which, by design or poor implementation, places a disproportionate, res disproportionate res responsibility on certain member states and encourages uncontrolled and irregular migratory flows to a fairer system which provides an orderly and safe pathway to the EU. Together, the UK and the EU are moving towards a more competent and more coordinated international response. With the international effort transitioning from an asylum-seeking programme towards a refugee resettlement programme, it's hoped that the risk of destitution and insecure immigration will be lessened. Presiding officer, the asylum and refugee crisis that we face across Europe is one of the biggest challenges of our time. We cannot help but mo be moved by the personal tragedies experienced by those fleeing conflict and persecution. To find a way forward, all levels of government must cooperate with one another and domestic policies should, al should align with the international response. In my closing remarks, I wish to recognise the efforts of those individuals who have offered their homes to those fleeing war zones or persecution. I also wish to recognise the work of dedicated refugee and asylum organisations in Scotland that have provided food, money, shelter and skilled advocacy support and organisations like Massive Outpouring of Love and Cafe DG2 in my constituency. Thank you. The last of the contributions in the open debate is Sandra White. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I was hoping that it would be a consensual debate. Uh, I think most people's contributions have been, but I honestly cannot take the hypocrisy from the Tory uh, side here, uh, basically who have caused more misery and suffering with their cuts to asylum seekers' help uh, and uh, destitution also. Perhaps if they'd let people in with some um, questions, we may have got some more answers from them. And when you stand and support a government that goes about uh, with a big white van telling refugees that they should go home, I really cannot um, praise them. Uh, basically, all I can do is highlight the hypocrisy uh, from which they come from. Uh, Signed officer, uh, I want to thank all the many, many people who have helped uh, over the years, uh, yourself included, uh, if you don't mind me mentioning that, presiding officer, for the work that uh, has been done since uh, the, the late 90s, basically, when I think we first saw the first tranche of uh, asylum seekers, refugees, coming not just to Glasgow, but Lanarkshire as well, and obviously Dungavel, where uh, the presiding officer, myself and many others, uh, were you know, instrumental in uh, closing Dungavel down, but took a long time and a long number of years also. And also the many groups and organisations who absolutely went out, demonstrated, fought, cajoled, whatever it may be, to ensure that people who came to this country were treated with dignity and respect, uh, particularly in the first tranche in Glasgow and Sight Hill and other areas. Uh, basically, people were quite frightened, didn't know what was happening, and people were there to reconcile, and integration took 
came about uh, and we have the fantastic Glasgow girls and others as well. So it can work when people are treated with respect and dignity and that's why I want to thank the committee for the report. I think it's a fantastic report and bringing this debate forward has been absolutely great. The contributions apart from the Tories have been absolutely excellent, I believe. And one of the issues which I feel particularly strongly about is the fact that people uh, do not have to go down to Croydon or Liverpool. That recommendation is something that myself and many, many other groups and individuals have been calling for for years and years and years. Uh, and I do sincerely hope that that recommendation will be delivered. I understand that we can't just deliver it ourselves as obviously immigration asylum. Uh, is reserved to Westminster, unfortunately. Uh, but I'm sure if the two governments can work together, then we can look forward to, to that recommendation being put forward. Uh, people, you know, facing, uh, you know, a traumatic experience, and I thank Mary Fee for her contribution in, in that respect of uh, what happens to people coming here and then they've got to go to Croydon or Liverpool. It must be absolutely so frightening when you've came from that to go down there. You don't even know that area also. So I really do want to make sure, hopefully, that that contribution, uh, that, that recommendation will be forthcoming. Now, a number of um, MSPs members uh, mentioned Christina McKelvey and David Torrance also mentioned the situation of mental health aspects and the impact destitution can have on people with mental health problems, not necessarily even when they arrived here, just the traumatising of that person from what they've been through. And I, I would like to just give you an example of one of the many, and I'm sure other you know, people here, members here, get this uh, in the post box or, or phoned in. And I want to give you one example of that. Uh, it was a lecturer from a college, it would be named who the person is or the, who the college is, contacted me and asked for my advice regarding one of their ESO students at the college. Uh, I'll just say he, so I won't give any indication of it's a he or a she. Uh, been in the UK now for almost six years. He says, I really want to ask for your, your advice. Can I request that? An asylum seeker, but during the entire time he's been here, he has not received any support from the Home Office. No accommodation, financial assistance, no other right to work to support himself, which I fully support in the report. Uh, they do admit it's rather unusual, but it seems that some asylum seekers qualify and some don't, depending on if it's been accepted via uh, the Home Office also. This particular person uh, was in a, involved in a trafficking case and uh, he was given 48 hours, 48 hours to leave his temporary accommodation, which was provided for by the charity Migrant Help. Now, this has rendered him completely homeless and again without any financial support. Meanwhile, his lawyer is planning to make a fresh claim for his asylum. But during this entire time, his mental health is in rapid decline. He's barely eaten in the last three weeks, barely slept. And in his own words, he has given up on life. I don't know if there's anything that you can do under these circumstances. It's obviously the lecturer uh, emailing me. But I find it appalling that there is absolutely no safety net for vulnerable people under his circumstances. The Red Cross, Positive Action Housing, which has already been mentioned, were helpful in terms of support, but do not have the resources to provide accommodation for him, whilst his asylum case can be reopened. I genuinely fear he will take his own life as a result of being trapped in the system for so many years and unable to help himself in any way. Please, can you bring it to the attention of others? This is humane, unfair to expect someone to live off nothing. If there's any way they can be assisted, I'd be very, very grateful. And then I just recently got uh, the email back in after having contacted the lawyer and various organisations. Thank you for your help. He was admitted to Levendale Hospital. I am not sure how long he will stay here, but he's still very stressed and is as far as I can see without hope. That's the reality of being a destitute asylum seeker here just now, not just in Scotland, but in the UK also. And I really sincerely thank the committee for the report, and I'm sure that we in Scotland could do something about it. Thank you very much, President Officer. We now move to the closing speeches, and I call on Polly McNeill. I can give you up to seven minutes, Ms McNeill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to wholeheartedly welcome the excellent report of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee. I believe the recommendations that you've made 
and the oral evidence that you took will make a significant contribution to the work of this Parliament in an area which many of us care very deeply about. But more than that, I don't think the report could come at a more crucial time than it has now. Calling for an anti-destitution strategy and many of the recommendations I think could never be more timely. As many other speakers have said, the world we live in right now, a world that we are not perhaps proud of, but help to create ourselves, where 65 million people are forced from their homes, 21 million of them are refugees, and staggeringly half of those are under the age of 18. 10 million are stateless, denied nationality, and we know that 53% of those refugees come from countries such as Syria, Afghanistan, where we've had an involvement, and Somalia. I'd like to mention that the Palestinian refugee population, which until recently had been the largest refugee population in the world, and that tragically many Palestinian refugees who uh, fled to Syria in 48 and 67 have now been displaced two or three times because of the Syrian conflict. But as others have eloquently talked about, many reasons why people flee their own countries, domestic violence, persecution on the grounds of sexuality, uh, where they come to seek sanctuary in a foreign country with which they usually have no connection. To be that person so desperate that you brave it all, in fact, brave your own life arriving in a foreign country with nothing, suffering, and really, there must be a lot of darkness in any person's life who's prepared to do that to get a better life. But as the report says, destitution is built into the UK asylum process. It's inevitable as the immigration system is designed to be hostile for those who do not have a legal right to be here. But I think there is some consensus among some speakers here this afternoon that what the system lacks built into the system is a human approach. It lacks humanity. Because once a person is destitute, then they are much harder to find. Quoting from the report, Graham O'Neill from the Scottish Refugee Council said that there was a significant risk of exploitation to any new member arriving in a country. Annie Wells talked about young girls, human trafficked uh, from other countries who are extremely vulnerable. And we have a moral obligation to those young women. They go into a twilight world and we don't always know how they get to Croydon is what Graham O'Neill went on to say or how they fund it and I suppose when you think about it how does a person who's never been to the UK before has no friends no connections find Croydon in the first place I couldn't tell you where it is I could tell you it is on a map find the funds travel there, make their application, it's obviously designed to put that person off. So I really want to get behind the committee's recommendation that registering in Scotland, to me, is a basic human requirement. Because whether your legal claim for asylum meets the test or not, is, is what matters here. It shouldn't really matter where you turn up to make that claim, the law will decide whether or not under our rules you are an asylum seeker and we've treated as a, a refu refugee. The report I think explains really well an important issue of uh, age disputed children and uh, children travelling alone. Of course when a young person comes here uh, there will be an age assessment on arrival and as the report says Many children just simply fear telling their stories and you really have to get the conditions right in order to get that information out of a young, a young person or a child. But of course, being a child, asylum seeker affects the type of support and the level of support that you get. So it doesn't matter that we are actually able to have a system that, that determines that. I've talked in this parliament before about a young eight-year-old boy, Najim, that I met in Cali refugee camp two years ago. I was asked to help find his family in London. And I would say that he's now safely with his family, eh, not to, to my efforts particularly, eh, but because I have to say the system did actually work, eh, that children are being reunited with their families. And I'm so pleased um, about that. 
But the issue of unaccompanied asylum seeker children um, is something that I think does require some more attention. And there can be no one more passionate or compassionate on the subject, as the Cabinet Secretary talked uh, this afternoon, than Lord Dubbs and the scheme which he helped to create, meaning that even more children, not enough as far as I am concerned, coming to Britain. I believe that Britain can take many more child refugees and whilst I welcome I think the 480 I think that we have I would prefer to see that number increase quite dramatically. Some of the recommendations made by the committee three I just want to mention I think the advocacy service is a superb idea and I want to wholeheartedly support that the right to make an application in Scotland which I've talked about but the right to do paid or unpaid work which is a long-standing, outstanding issue that does need addressed. The reason I think that an advocacy service is very important when you're trying to prevent destitution in an asylum-seeking um, system is that every person would get access to some guidance uh, to, to, to see their way through the system. Now, of course, that's distinct from legal representation. And I think that would provide a central role in preventing more people becoming lost or hidden and becoming destitute because they would be signposted along the way into the actual process and how it works. Um, I've, t I've talked about uh, the right to make an application in Scotland. The right to paid work or unpaid work. I mean, I believe this for some time. Um, and if you've ever had any insight into the life of someone seeking asylum, how despairing it is to be unproductive, then you'll understand how important that recommendation is. I, I'll conclude, Presiding Officer, with, with, with this. I see that I'm at my seven minutes. I just wanted to end with, um, uh, like many members, the UN Committee on Detention um, met with some members of this parliament um, earlier on this year. And it convinced me that we have a poor record in the way that we detain people, like Sandra White of Campaign for Dungable to be closed. I, I believe it's a fundamental right of every uh, democratic elected member to go to any prison or any place of detention. I've written to David Mundell about this. I haven't had a reply. I give him the benefit of the doubt that that's because of the election. But following that election, I expect as an elected member of this parliament to go and inspect the conditions of which people being detained in our country are. And on that note, thank you, presiding officer. I call Donald Cameron around seven minutes, please. Thank you, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to be able to close this debate for the Scottish Conservatives today and would reiterate the comments of others across the Chamber in terms of our shared commitment to do whatever we can to support reasonable and workable actions that help support some of the most vulnerable people in our societies. Annie Wells has said we will be supporting the committee motion tonight. We recognise that it is absolutely essential in this area, above all, for the Scottish Government and the UK Government to uh, work together and I entirely support what Christina McKelvey said in, in her statement in that regard and also thank her for the tone in which she opened this debate. Debates like this are often peppered with passions and rightly so it's a sensitive and highly important matter and should be treated as such and I was very struck by the individual stories of hardship and struggle in the committee report which we should of course take into account. Some of those stories were incredibly moving and as Gail Ross said, it's quite right that we think of people uh, rather than statistics. Uh, we also need to balance this with the evidence in, uh, to hand. And I would like to do that in my closing remarks. Because there are many elements of the report which I believe are very worthwhile and should be taken forward. And one issue dear to my heart is the proposal of a new advocacy service which the report asks the government to consider. Uh, and it's been mentioned by many people already. Um, one of the most formative experiences of my professional life was appearing in the Asylum and Immigration Tribunal, as it was then called, in my early years as practicing as an advocate uh, in Bothell Street in Glasgow, and representing asylum seekers there. Um, and my first observation is, is that the rules and regulations surrounding immigration law are formidable and, and hugely complicated, um, and very difficult for, for anyone, let alone a lawyer, to navigate. But my second observation is just how difficult it is when representing asylum seekers for these applicants to argue their cases successfully and how much more so would that be true if such an asylum seeker met the legal definition of being destitute. So um, I think the proposal for an independent advocacy service is, is to be welcomed. Deputy Presiding Officer, I want to focus the rest of my comments on, on health care 
Um, I feel this is a significantly important area when considering how we support refugees, asylum seekers, and in particular those who find themselves being destitute. And the report of the committee notes that some people who have come to the UK um, carry transmittable diseases such as TB, HIV, AIDS, and others. And now, quite plainly, this poses a very serious health issue for the individual carrying such a disease. And the report notes many of the barriers faced by people with such conditions to receiving treatment. Issues include the distance to health centres, access to a GP, issues with contact between the patient and health workers, and crucially, the willingness of a patient seeking treatment. Now, treating HIV and AIDS is particularly difficult because of the cultural perceptions and stigma which continue to exist around the condition. And whilst this is true to some extent in general society, it is exacerbated amongst migrant communities, and in particular those from sub-Saharan African communities. Many find themselves embarrassed about the condition and are worried about others within their own community finding out. And as the HIV and Hepatitis C charity Waverly Care noted, those who find themselves living with friends or accessing shelter homes have less privacy and are at greater risk of refusing to take HIV medication as a result. Like others, I would also like to note the impact on mental health as a result of destitution. The report indicates a variety of serious examples that contribute to diminished mental health, such as young female asylum seekers being trafficked and individuals suffering from domestic servitude. Indeed, the Glasgow Psychological Trauma Service notes in the report that mental health gets worse because of destitution, which then exacerbates such pre-existing mental health issues. I also feel it would be pertinent to raise here the final substantial healthcare concern documented in the committee's report, that being the issue of maternity services for those who find themselves destitute. As the report notes, many pregnant women feel reluctant to talk about their pregnancy and some feel shame about it for various reasons. This poses a serious set of risks to women, including an increased incidence of maternal death due to an underlying condition or complexities during birth because of undisclosed conditions. And the report also focuses on the issue of FGM, which this parliament has quite properly discussed at length in the past. If the Scottish Government does indeed intend to take forward the report recommendation to create a Scottish anti-destitution strategy, I believe that the issues of tackling stigma, be that around mental health, be that around treatment of transmittable diseases, or be that around pregnancy that can exist in some migrant communities, then that would require further examination and inclusion in such a strategy. In closing, Deputy Presiding Officer, I want to um, quickly touch on some of the remarks made by various people across the chamber. Annie Wells, uh, I'd like um, to welcome the fact that she has today written to um, the UK government to consider if it's possible for claims to be lodged in Scotland. Um, other speakers include Finlay Carson, who put into context the dimension of what is happening internationally and will quite rightly put on record uh, what the UK government has done in terms of their efforts there. Uh, Pauline McNeill um, spoke with great passion and um, sympathy about a migrant arriving here and the destitution they face and the complexity of the system that meets them. Uh, and I was very struck by, by her contribution. Deputy Presiding Officer, it is clear that we continue to live in an uncertain world with many unstable reg regions. The United Kingdom and Scotland will continue to be a beacon of hope for many people looking for a better life. And in Scotland, we need to use the powers that this parliament possesses to support people who choose to make Scotland their home. And I would reiterate the importance of ensuring that we have a suitable and specific strategy which deals with issues such as mental and public health in order to achieve this. We can't always solve or eliminate every cause and circumstance that leads to destitution, but we can employ measures that can help get people into a more stable environment for their benefit and for the benefit of Scotland as a whole. Thank you. I call Angela Constance around seven minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. President Officer, the convener of the committee opened the debate saying that first and foremost we should be uh, approaching this debate today and the issue at hand about destitution in the immigration and uh, asylum system uh, with uh, humanity uh, in our hearts and our minds. And I agree uh, with that sentiment that first and foremost uh, we are dealing with a, a humanitarian issue and as Pauline McNeill outlined in many cases, uh, a humanitarian uh, crisis that we're seeing uh, across the world uh, with the biggest displacement of people since World War II. 
Mary Fee uh, also uh, aptly in her contribution spoke about how destitution is built into uh, the immigration uh, and asylum system and I agree with that. And when you look at the statistics provided uh, by uh, the British Red Cross uh, who in 2013 uh, said that 72 out of the 539 people that they dealt with, 13% uh, were living uh, in destitution. And how that in 2016 has increased to 49%. And their figures, when you look at 870 in destitute individuals out of the 1,600 individuals that they worked with, they are dealing with an increasing proportion of people in need but also an increasing proportion of people facing uh, dire uh, detribution. Annie Wells said uh, in her remarks that she would be holding the Scottish Government to account uh, with regard to the human trafficking uh, strategy and other matters. Uh, that's fair enough uh, and quite right too. But uh, I do have to stress that that will also uh, be reciprocated in terms of members across there uh, at the other side of the Chamber uh, and indeed uh, the UK Government. Because Jeremy Balfour said something uh, really interesting. He said we can't take uh, a simplistic approach to this issue, that we shouldn't just focus on uh, one or two issues. And actually, I agree with that, because I believe that it's clear that the asylum system needs wholesale change. And we in this government are not shy in seeking out the UK government, but they do indeed have to reciprocate. Um, and we do need to get out of the situation where it's this government that is always chasing the UK government uh, to meet or indeed uh, chasing up replies uh, to our correspondence. So I hope Miss Wells gets a speedy uh, reply uh, to her uh, letter. And the Scottish Government uh, will continue to do what it can to support people facing destitution uh, and we'll continue to work uh, for an approach that's based on fairness, dignity and partnership and prevention. And I did hear the, the glib remark that, well, if the Scottish Government wants uh, to mitigate, we can. And of course we can and do uh, mitigate uh, with our support to the Scottish Refugee Council, uh, Positive Action Housing uh, and others. But what we should be about throughout our partnership working is actually preventing uh, destitution uh, in the first place. And my view is that there should be a holistic end-to-end uh, -end system of support to ensure that people who are seeking asylum do not end up uh, penniless uh, in our street. And the Scottish Government, local government and the third sector, we are already being left to pick up the pieces uh, of the current system. And of course we want to do what we can. There is indeed, as someone said earlier, a moral, a real moral imperative. But, you know, we pay our taxes. We pay our taxes to the UK government and we've got a right to expect that those services that are currently reserved, we've got a right to expect that fairness, dignity and respect and prevention uh, should be part of those services. And we've got the right also to demand and expect uh, that prevention, preventing destitution at source uh, should be what we're all aiming for. And as Mary Fee outlined in her contribution also, the situation will only get worse when the asylum support provisions in the Immigration Act 2016 are implemented and support is cut uh, further still, including uh, to families. And we'll also see the increasing uh, criminalisation as well. Now, I won't have time, President Officer, to go through all the recommendations, all 28 recommendations uh, from the committee's report, but I'll reiterate what I said in my opening remarks, that we will look at all the recommendations sympathetically. We will look at them with a can-do approach, whilst recognising uh, the legal limitation uh, of our powers. And I note that six or seven of the recommendations are actually reserved uh, to the UK Government, but committee has asked the Scottish Government to negotiate, to try and work in partnership uh, with the UK Government over things like uh, extending the destitute domestic violence concession uh, and also uh, with regards to the issue of the right to work. Um, uh, yes, I'll, 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 I'll. Christina McKelvey. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for taking intervention on that point. Obviously, the right to work is one way 
to enable people not to have to face destitution at all. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary is aware that just today the Irish Supreme Court ruled that it's unconstitutional to ban refugees from working in Ireland and maybe we should take some lessons from Ireland and use that in our negotiations with the United Kingdom Government. Christine, sorry, Cabinet Secretary. Well, here, here to the Irish Supreme Court, um, I would be interested to know uh, what the UK Supreme Court uh, would make of uh, such a challenge, but we will indeed, uh, as a government, uh, look at our uh, Irish friends uh, and neighbours and uh, look at that issue closely, because the fundamental point uh, here is that I actually believe that, that all human beings, all citizens have the or should have the right to work. Work is part of who we are, it's part of our identity. And what comes across to me time and time again when I meet uh, refugees uh, or asylum seekers, they not only want to start uh, a new life in Scotland, they want to make a contribution. They want to make a contribution uh, to their communities and uh, to uh, their new country. And we shouldn't be uh, hindering them from, from doing so. Poseidon I know that my time is running short. I don't want to eat into the uh, vice convener of the committee his time to, to sum up. But I just want to end on the point about the UK government's U-turn on the Dubs Amendment. Because to me, that is tantamount to turning our back uh, on children at risk. Children at real risk of peril. And the point that I would have put to Finlay Carson um, if he had taken an intervention is that uh, currently Interpol 10,000 unaccompanied asylum-seeking children, 10,000, have went missing over the past two years. Where are they? How can we stand by and just think it's all right for 10,000 children uh, to go missing? These children face the, the, the perils of abuse, exploitation, uh, human uh, trafficking. And he spoke, as did other members, about showing some love in our policies, whether it's a response to the international crisis that's you know, surrounding or in our domestic policy. What about these 10,000 children uh, that have went missing? And where are they, presiding officer? Because while I note that the UK government in their uh, recent manifesto uh, now say that they want to offer asylum and refuge uh, to people in parts of the world affected by conflict and oppression rather than those who have made it to Britain. What does that say about the people who have come here uh, via uh, routes involving human trafficking? What about those children uh, who have come via clandestine routes? How are they fed? Uh, how are they supported? What does that say uh, about the human trafficking strategy uh, across the UK? What does that say uh, in uh, the name of humanity, uh, presiding officer? Presiding officer, I uh, just want to reiterate to committee that the Scottish Government will indeed uh, do what we can to be coming to this issue uh, with solutions. But I do hope and would like to hope that in seeing the evidence that the committee has painstakingly gathered that the new UK Government would also consider the damage that its asylum and immigration policies are causing to people. People who are only trying to find what we all want and need, a safe place to live, a safe place to raise our families and to make a contribution to our community and to our country. Thank you. Thank you, Cole. Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I very much welcome the opportunity to contribute to the debate in my role as Deputy Convener for the Equalities and Human Rights Committee. This is the first time I've had the privilege to undertake the summation of business led by my committee. I'm very much looking forward to the challenge of closing on such an important and wide-ranging debate. Given the reserved and devolved aspects of the subject area of our inquiry and the proximity of the general election, it's inevitable that the debate has generated some exchanges. However, in bringing this debate to a close, I do want to thank members from all parties for the conciliatory tone that I think we can all agree has been adopted in this debate. I want to re-emphasise that the purpose of our inquiry, which is to understand why those, in many cases, fleeing conflict or persecution overseas, can become destitute in this country and what can be done to mitigate their plight. I also want to put on uh, record my thanks to our convener, Christine McKelvey, the committee members, our clerks and the officials who serve us so well. We work very well together, I think, examining the evidence before us, each of us getting to grips, which is what it is a very complex system in terms of asylum and immigration in our country, in order to gain a clearer understanding of these issues. We also talk to a number of people on the front line. 
as well as those in need of support, so we could reflect on what actions the Scottish Government might take to improve their situation. I'm very gratified to hear the Cabinet Secretary reflect on those in her closing remarks. In particular, I want to underline what the convener said at the beginning of the debate, that destitution of asylum seekers and those with insecure immigration status and no recourse to public funds re represents really a humanitarian issue and one that is being measured out in the li lived experience of thousands of people in our society on the edge in many cases of crushing poverty and social isolation. And we have heard some heart-rending stories today uh, in that context. To put this in perspective, the UN global poverty target for developing countries is $1.25 a day. Destitute people have no access to money. And this is a, a shocking realization in this, our country, one of the world's wealthiest nations. It has been heartening to listen to the consensus in the chamber the, this afternoon. I think remarked on by Donald Cameron a few moments ago. And there have been a variety of well-made points. But above all, there is a general agreement that the action that action has to be taken to ensure vulnerable people are not forced into destitution to become more vulnerable to exploitation and abuse. And we are fortunate non-governmental third sector and charitable organisations alongside public services have provided vital support to fill that gap. But this is not sustainable. A coordinated national approach is required, not least because there is potential for wider dispersal of asylum seekers, further compounding existing issues. I'd like to thank Christina McKelvey for her opening remarks. She rightly re referenced the disparity in things like the application of child protection legislation, which I will come on to again later, um, particularly in respect of unaccompanied children seeking asylum, and in uh, the shattering poverty that those with no recourse to public funds uh, uh, experience. I also very much welcome the intervention she made just now on the Cabinet Secretary, bringing with it, as she did, news from the Irish Supreme Court, who, with impeccable timing, have uh, today ruled that asylum seekers should be able to work in the Republic of Ireland, something I would like to see in this United Kingdom as well. The Cabinet Secretary, in her opening remarks, spoke very eloquently of the successes of the Syrian resettlement programme and how our country meets the integration of such refugees with compassion and friendship. Mary Fee reminded us in harrowing terms of the plight of female asylum seekers and the, very difficult, the great difficulties they face in the, the actual link between insecure immigration status and abuse. And this was a theme developed in an excellent speech by Gail Ross when she talked about the particular iniquity of the way in which the current system sees women have to stay with abusive partners so as to avoid that immigration trap. Presiding officer, if you'll permit me, I'll make a number of observations on the committee's recommendations and considerations that I hope will inform the chamber still further. On the asylum process, we were given a clear mes uh, message that destitution is quote unquote built into the UK asylum process. Newly arrived asylum applicants are vulnerable to exploitation, including sexual exploitation, to fund travel to access uh, the asylum process in Croydon. And it was particularly gratifying to hear Annie Wells call on her own home office to change practices so that asylum cases can be heard here in Scotland. This answer, if it happens, this will answer the challenge outlined to us by David Torrance. I will indeed. Uh, thank you. Does uh, Alex Cole Hamilton agree with me that it's very disappointing that no member of the UK government could actually come to committee to give evidence? Alex Cole Hamilton. It was, and I think, an indictment of uh, the UK government that no uh, member of that department was forthcoming. I think there were some very searching questions that still need to be answered by the UK government, but we will persist in putting those to them. Um, it was also nice to hear Sandra White recognise, I think, that uh, Annie Wells' call on the Home Office to change process in that way. We know people arriving in Northern Ireland do not have to travel to Croydon to make an initial claim, and it is unacceptable that destitute, vulnerable people arriving in Scotland are forced to continue in the UK, and uh, what will have already been a very, very difficult journey. Asylum seekers are most at risk of experiencing destitution when their claim had been refused and they had no recourse to public funds. But even those who had been granted refugee status are required to vacate their asylum accommodation after 28 days found themselves homeless and without access to support because of delays in accessing benefits. Another significant theme in this disparity between dispersal system and the vulnerable persons resettlement programme. 31 out of 32 councils 
were taking part in Syrian vulnerable persons resettlement program. Many uh, of the witnesses held up the resettlement program as the gold standard approach. And I think, as Ross Greer made the point, it gives the lie to the UK government's suggestion that there is a lack of capacity in UK local authorities to take vulnerable children as per the Dubs Amendment. In contrast, however, local authorities were apprehensive about taking part in the wider asylum dispersal as they do not currently have experience knowledge or resources, a point taken up later by Jeremy Balfour when he referenced the uh, lack of training, information and use of guidance in local authorities at a grassroots level. I should point out to Mr Balfour, however, though, that he expresses concern that um, the legal advice to asylum seekers is still concentrated in the central belt. I hope, therefore, that he will very much come in behind Annie Wells' uh, call of their home office to change the rules and processes around um, hearing asylum outside of Croydon and perhaps in Scotland. We are concerned a two-tier system as such is being created, which will seriously damage the prospect of integration for those left destitute. Furthermore, the con committee learned of the historic disparity of how various local authorities and social workers in terms of the application of looked after children's status to young and unaccom um, unaccompanied asylum seekers who present to local authorities in Scotland. And this was a theme picked up in her closing remarks by Pauline McNeill. We need to be absolutely clear in guidance and training that those young people who appear on our shores should be immediately afforded a status, that status of being in care and with it the aftercare that this entails, particularly important to victims of child trafficking who, as we know, face being re-trafficked if they are not given adequate support. Uh, my time is very short, so I will conclude by saying, uh, presiding officer, that today, today's debate has shone a light on a hidden crisis in our society. I trust that members of the Scottish Government will reflect on the committee's evidence and our recommendations and see this debate as a turning point, if you like, a watershed moment. We look forward to uh, considering the government's response, the committee's report, and I wish to emphasise that we are committed to monitoring progress throughout this parliamentary session so that we can confirm there has been a positive shift from hidden lives to new beginnings. I commend the report and the evidence the committee has gathered to the parliament. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our debate on Hidden Lives New Beginnings. We turn now to our next item of business, which is decision time. And there is one question to be put as a result of today's business. The question is that motion 5802, in the name of Christina McKelvey, on behalf of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, is agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. That concludes decision time. We'll now move to members' business in the name of Jackie Bailey. We'll just take a few moments for members to change seats.